Estonia. 14 by 26, 10 two block bass drum. Of that collection, which Daniel had a picture of, only the bass drum belonged to Gene. All the other stuff belonged to a guy named Don Hay. He was a friend of mine. I used to go visit that bass drum <laughs> in his living room at least once a month in Cadenceville, Maryland. And I would sit there with the thing on my lap, just sort of going, Ooh, this is so good, and Don. <laughs> and then I lost it when Don passed away. I lost contact. But I know that bass drum and all the other equipment, I know it well. Um, so that would have been the bass drum that immediately preceded this style. This style he used, and this is one of, it's all in my book. Which Here's is yet the cover to be published, right here. But, Brooks has a book coming out very shortly it's called about GK. Krupa's gear. And the tools that built the legend. It's kind of dense. Um, he had, by 1945, uh, he already had shown using six different 14 by 26 bass drums. Sometimes in tandem because he would have to be at the Capitol Theater, but at the same time he'd have to go over and play with Eddie Condon at Town Hall, same day. He actually had people, music stores, hold his drums until he needed them. Can you get that set over to Town Hall by 7 o'clock, whatever. Several music stores did that, primarily Frank's, which was the store that used to be his favorite drum guy, and good friend Bill Mather. Bill Mather owned the shop. Bill Mather, eventually, Bill Mather was gone. Frank Ippolito took over Mather's shop, lock, stock, and barrel. One of Mather's friends and employees was our friend, my dear friend, the late Charlie Donnelly. That's how far back that lineage goes. Mather has wonderful stories about things that he would do. Other people have wonderful Mather stories. He was a real character. Smoke cigars constantly, white owls. People would walk into his shop, which was a basement shop, and choke to death. It's like, are you going to Mather's up? Oh, good luck. Take your gas mask. He stored everything, including what you saw a minute ago, little Tom Toms that were mounted on the bandstand. He was the guy who helped Gene with his new drums. He was the one who figured out how to make the shell-mounted cymbal holders that weren't there at Carnegie Hall in 38, weren't there when Gene was playing Sing Sing Sing, but they were there soon after. Before that, it was those, rim mount. So normally, as you probably know, there were two rim mount cymbal holders, but Dan is such a pain in the butt that he had to, oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, normally he would have, yeah. But you see, this is later. This is when they're shell-mounted. Oh, they're shell-mounted. This is the wire brush cymbal, which is also down here. Rarely used, but there it was. Those were the, the three things that Gene kept, sort of in deference to the earlier vaudeville, drummers have to make every noise that we want them to make. Whether it's a duck call or fish, they have to be standing there ready to do it. So he kept those three. Even this one eventually went away. Rico symbol, cowbell stayed on. Anyway, he uses all of these all the time in recordings. They're not necessarily hard, to, uh, easy to hear, but you can. Calf skin heads up until the early 60s. Many different front bass drums heads. I have a whole chapter on just front bass drum head artwork. Um, this is my favorite. So anyway, that's it. 14 by 26, 9 by 13, 16 by 16, not two toms, just one. Six and a half snare drum with the big band. The small group set, completely different set. And we're talking about the recording you listen to of After You've Gone with Gene. Totally different drum set. 12 by 24 bass drum, two lug, eight two lug, not even catalog. Five by 14 Slingerland solid maple snare. Not yet even a radio king. Two mounted toms, nine by 13 on the left, seven by 11 on the right. And the first versions of those were still tubelug also. One of those still exists on the West Coast. I know who it is. I'm gunning for it. <laughs> I'm going to track him down. 
No, he owns the small mound of town that was a five by ten. So when you were listening to after you've gone, that was the set you were hearing, not the one in Hollywood Hotel. So big difference. Anyway, real quickly, I guess, any questions, technical questions? You can ask them now or I'm going to be around. I'm Actually, happy to talk about it. At the end of the clinic, if you guys want to come up and I think, Brooks, you can answer questions then. Yep. I just want to keep moving. Yep. Um, but beautiful. Okay. Thank yeah. you, Brooks. And then <laughs> you can come take a look at this beauty up close. Two other or a couple other really important things I want to point out about Brooks had mentioned the uh, the shield logo right we're all familiar with that well in the 1920s if you recall most bass drums had um, a painted front head a scene on there right the mountain mountain lake the log cabin etc etc and I, I would suffice to say that Gene is pretty much responsible Absolutely his fame for for um, yeah for for changing the whole vibe of what you would put on the front uh, head of your bass drum but that's also why the BG is bigger than the GK, because he was embarrassed. Right. The first one Mather did, it was the reverse. Ah. And Gene didn't like that because it made him look like it was his band. Right, and the band leaders didn't like the drummer's initials being so big, so then it became <laughs> band leader initials big, and then, and then Benny drummer initials small. And by putting his own initials in the shield after Gene left. Oh, he put his own initials, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, so that, that, that never changes. Um, <laughs> And uh, so, you know, I mean, I just, let me play a little kind of 1920s style drumming for you guys, just so you can kind of get an idea of how some of this stuff was used. Um, so, let me put the snares back on. drums sound great, they feel great, and there's some important things. The drums have calf heads on them, so they have this nice, mellow, warm sound, which is part of why that music sounds the way it is. It's like a rumbling and a grumbling. The big bass drum, 26 inches, is wide open, so you, as Louis Belson used to talk about, and he told me, you would feel the bass drum, you didn't hear it, right? That was the idea of the feathering technique. So you had this big drum, that's why you didn't need a bass player in the small groups. Um, and everything just has this warm sound. The early hi-hat cymbals here are very small. These are uh, probably 11 inches. And when the hi-hats first came out, the idea was to like get this very legato sound. So sort of swing era big band music, you'd hear this, the idea, like the analogy that I always use is that when you, when you play that bass drum, it's like you're hitting someone in the butt with a pillow, right? So again, it's like, boom, 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 boom. And these were nice and washy. So when you, when you hear 1930s music, the reason the drums sound different is because these things, the cymbals are much smaller extremely thin, very bendable, very pliable. Um, not a Krupa setup, but I have a little 14 inch Chinese symbol here, a Wuhan with 10 rivets in it, and I just love it. It just sounds so great at the end of a fill. You know, it's just, it's beautiful, it's explosive, it gets in, it gets out quick. So I kind of brought that for my own security blanket, I guess you could say, because I, I haven't played Brooks' drums a lot. All right, so, Let's keep moving. Um, and I'm very excited for that book to come out. It's going to be it's going to be amazing. It's go. It, Brooks will have it with him, and he's over at the table where we have the merch and all that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the recording. So uh, Benny Goodman had played this on a radio show, but they hadn't officially recorded it. They didn't officially record it until 1937. And what did they do for a whole entire year between Louis Prima 
and their version coming out is that every night they jammed on it. And it quickly lost out as a vocal tune and became a, 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 a band recording. And they also added um, uh, some other sections. And so with the band jamming on it, it got longer and longer and longer and longer. By the time they record it in 1937, it's almost nine minutes long. Okay, this is very unusual uh, for the time because at the time you recorded on 78 RPM records and they could only hold like three or three and a half minutes of music per side. Uh, the one they used with Benny Goodman's band was a 12 inch, so it was a little bigger, so they could get all the nine minutes on there, but it was split between two parts. So often what you see, this is the original label from the Victor recording, you see Sing Sing Sing. What I love is that all the band members' names are listed, how cool is that, <laughs> on the label, because they didn't have liner notes yet on 78s. And uh, this is part one. So literally, you'll hear when I perform the song, I'm going to perform parts one and two, you would have to stop turn over the record and basically the song would continue. So they would have to figure out a way to kind of break the song in half. And so if you ever see on old records, part one and part two, for example, how many people here know Topsy by Cozy Cole? It was Topsy part two. It was the second half of a, of a two part record essentially and part two became a hit, but there's a part one as well. So let's look at a couple of the other sections then that were added to the original Louis Prima version. One of them was a song uh, called Christopher Columbus. Um, and you guys will all recognize it, but it's very different. So Christopher Columbus is a song that was written also in 1936 by Fats Waller. It's a groovy little piano tune, a little small group swing tune. And it's great, you hear Fats singing. <laughs> and he wrote really engaging, humorous songs, Fat. Fats Waller. Alright, so that's crazy. Now, this is what Benny Goodman did with that exact same thing. So this is from what we were going to hear. Now it's more of a minor. And you all recognize this, right? It's a very famous part of Sing Sing Sing, when we hear Sing Sing. 